So welcome, welcome, welcome our remarkable colleague, Kamara. We so appreciate your consistent leadership. And as always at Setsi, we begin all things by giving thanks and acknowledging our creator. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Kamara, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and share a bit about your remarkable work? Yes, I'd love to. Thanks so much for having me, Victor. It's really amazing to be here. Um, so my name's Kamara Kondo, my pronouns are she and her. Um, a bit of my about my background and how I got to where I am today. So um, I am the child, I'm a child of Jamaican parents, so Jamaican heritage, as you can probably tell from my accent, I was born and raised in London, England. Um, and I grew up there. I went to university um, in Liverpool, like six hours away from London and studied law. Um, but after I finished my degree, I was pretty sure that I didn't want to be a lawyer, but I knew that I wanted to use that legal knowledge for good. Um, and so I started working for an LGBTQ charity in England called Stonewall. They're the largest um, uh, LGBTQ advocacy organization in Europe, um, and they do amazing work. Um, and then I moved to Canada. So I moved to Canada in 2011, um, and I started working for Volunteer Toronto, which is the largest volunteer centre in Canada. I spent seven years there, eventually becoming the executive director. And then I pivoted and moved into higher education. And so I've been working at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson University, for those of you who knew it as that. Um, and now I work within a public policy and leadership think tank called the Dais. Um, and we do work that basically um, begins to look at the big issues that affect Canadians, things like cybersecurity, AI, democracy, trust, um, the education sector, the skills that are needed for the future. And I head up our leadership development team. So I'm the director of leadership development there. That's incredible. Your background is extensive. Your body of work is absolutely remarkable. And thank you for sharing all that context. Really appreciate you. So my next question, what's inspiring you right now? What has you curious or what's keeping you up at nights? Those are some great questions. Those are some great questions. I think what's inspiring me is I've been doing a lot of thinking about how far I've come and what I've learned in my professional journey. And I'm constantly thinking about how I can give back to the younger people who are coming up are coming up next. Um, I've been working a bit with an organization called Accelerate Her Future. They're an amazing career accelerator for young BIPOC women who are interested in business and STEM fields. And so um, I've loved supporting their work and I'm part of their advisory council, which has been incredibly rewarding. Um, outside of that, I, this is a bit unusual, but um, I when I moved to Canada, I really, really noticed how amazing the Canadian outdoors is, but I had no real way of accessing it. Um, eventually I was able to go on a hike and I fell in love with hiking. And I eventually went on to create my own nonprofit called Let's Hike TO. And so uh, we're running this organization, me and my team, in completely volunteer run, um, but we're really trying to get more Canadians, specifically though, newcomers, uh, BIPOC and uh, young adults into the outdoors and making it easy for them to do so. Um, so we've led over, I think, over 1,600 hikes. We've had about 2,000 people come hiking with us over the past two years since we started. And so for me, something that I'm often thinking about is how can I make the organization sustainable? How can I keep it going? But also how can we include more and more people in our work? That's absolutely incredible. Congrats. <laughs> 1,600. My goodness. Yeah, it grew, it grew very quickly. And I Good. think when we started, it was during the pandemic and lots of people were keen to meet others, but getting outside was a safe way to do it. That's incredible. Congratulations. So my next question, what challenges and barriers do you face in your work? And what are some of the ways and means that you and your team are approaching these challenges and barriers? Yeah, that's a great question. I think in my work at TMU, uh, one of the biggest challenges we face is um, like really thinking about what are the leadership development and the professional development programs that people need to be able to influence public policy? Um, who are the people that don't have easy access to that type of education? And then how can we provide that education, education in a way that's accessible um, and easy for people to understand and take part in despite their busy lives and the, the many priorities that they have? Um, increasingly, we've been looking at micro-credentials as a way of offering education in a way that's more digestible. For those who don't know, micro-credentials are short courses, typically 12 weeks or shorter, um, and they're basically like an opportunity to take, take in an educational topic in a bite-sized way. 
um, and very much they're, they're kind of aligned with the labor market and what skills are currently missing in the labor market. And then the organizations that develop them always work very closely with employers to ensure that those short courses are very, um, very related to what employers are looking for when people actually then enter the labor, the labor market. And so we've been developing a couple of micro credentials at, um, at the dais. And one that I'm particularly proud of is one that my colleague, Rahel PJ David actually created. Um, it's called Leading Through Policy Change, and it's really focused on teaching people how to create systemic change if they have absolutely no or very little education or formal education in public policy. So if you haven't had the privilege of going to university to study political science or public administration, you might not know the ins and outs of how the Canadian democratic systems work. And so Rahel's built out this amazing course that essentially teaches that over the course of eight weeks and includes some of Canada's top policymakers that talk about what they think people should be doing if they want to truly try to influence the laws and the policies that, that govern us in society. That's incredible. I just actually had a meeting a couple of days ago with my wife and a colleague that um, does some incredible work in agroforestry. And he was talking about going back to school to get his master's in public policy and not, not recognizing that there's models just like this, micro-credentials that are so important in terms of labor market intervention. So once again, thank you so much for, for sharing that and that remarkable innovative work in terms of supporting um, Canadians. So, so my next question, do you have a set of key priorities right now in your work? Yes. Um, I think I would say at TMU, my priorities are a few things. Maybe I'll talk about my professional work and my life work. Um, in my professional work, I'd say some of my priorities are expanding the, the audience who use our, and access our programming. I think that's so important. We're really trying to scale outside of Toronto as well. Uh, as you probably know, TMU is based right downtown at the heart of Young and Dundas. Um, and so many of our learners come from the GTA we're keen to have people from both sides of the coast and, and the territories accessing our programming because much of it is online. And so that's something that I'm constantly thinking about. Um, as well, we're thinking about what additional programming do we need to offer to, to, to folks? What are the, the kind of gaps that exist when it comes to public policy literacy? Um, and I'm also just thinking about what can we do to ensure that um, people can because our program is paid people can still access it even if they have financial barriers so considering are there bursaries that we need to offer or are there funders we need to be working with who can um support the program the programs that we offer and subsidize them to make them a bit more affordable as well in my um in my my personal work i think some of my my goals are oddly just to rest i've had a very busy busy last year i got married um i, I got my first step into real estate uh, investment last year um a lot of things happened in the past year professionally and personally for me and so for 2024 I just want to rest I want to be napping more I want to be sleeping better I want to be looking after my body more um and that's that's really what I'm hoping to do I share I share I couldn't agree more rest is a form of resistance nap ministry all that good stuff <laughs> exactly so so how do you feel about the future of educational attainment in Canada the future of public policy the future of the work that drives you yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I think the future of public policy, is, I think it's going to be an interesting time for Canada in the next couple of years. We're going to go through an election that may well change the um, the priorities of the government and what, what the government is funding. Um, while I think many people are conscious that that might be scary, I think there's always an opportunity when there's change for, uh, for people to sometimes challenge or maybe get involved in new ways. Um, I am very rejuvenated by young people who I'm seeing across Canada take action. Um, I think often young people, if they're not seeing it happen themselves, and if, if they're not seeing uh, organizations in power and people in power taking action on matters that, that matter to them, they're often doing it themselves. And I think that's really, really exciting. Um, I think there's been some, some great examples in terms of um, indigenous leaders across Canada doing some amazing work. We've seen some amazing climate leaders um, and we're, we're excited about that at the dais. Um, I think in terms of education, I think it's tough in education right now, budgets are very tight. I know it sounds a bit ironic because many people think of universities as being these like very kind of wealthy institutions, but I think budgets are tight. Um, there's been lots of conversation around international students and um, their experiences coming to Canada and becoming students within the, the educational systems that we have and whether or not they're, they're experiencing the right supports and have access to, you know, housing and, um, and, and, you know, academic supports that they need. And so I think that will be an evolving conversation. I'm not sure where it will go, but I'm fascinated to see, 
to what extent the universities will be able to truly adapt and support international students in the way that they need to. And then I think if I'm honest, I think students are expecting more and more value for their money. I think it's a big decision to go to university and invest in a master's or a bachelor's. And so I think that students are becoming um, more aware that they're customers of universities and more um, insistent that they get the best value for money. And I'm definitely noticing that amongst the students that I speak to, but I'm sure that's happening nationwide. Um, I'm hoping the universities will increasingly become a lot more adaptive to what's happening in the outside world and what's happening in the labor market and, the, and, and ensuring that their content and the curriculum is always very career focused. Uh, but I think there's a journey for that to happen. I don't think universities are there yet. That's absolutely incredible. So my second last question, what is your ultimate goal and how does success look like and feel like to you and your colleagues? Yeah, maybe I'll share that my ultimate goal personally as, as Kamara is that um, I I always feel like my, my life mission is to improve people's lives. And I've done that in every single one of my jobs in some way, shape or form, whether it was working to change public policy that impacted the LGBTQ community in, in England, or whether it was working at Volunteer Toronto to give people a better understanding of how they can improve others' lives through volunteering um, or build up their skill sets through volunteering. And then here at the dais, definitely helping people understand how they can improve their own lives and others' lives through influencing those policies that, that govern us. Um, for me, that's something that will be fundamental to all of the work I do, whether it's inside or outside of work. And it really drives me. And it's it's what helps me wake up in the morning and, and feel like I'm ready to start my day. At the dais, our big aim is to really ensure that we provide a platform that provides an opportunity for better leaders and better policies to really be created within Canada. And so I think for us, I think we're very keen to continue doing cutting edge research on issues that affect Canadians. Um, I think we're interested in ensuring that um, leaders who have great ideas have a platform to talk about them, but also that we're giving new leaders um, or leaders who want to bolster their skills the opportunity to do that through our programs. Incredible. Thank you. So my last question, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for our listeners and viewers? Yeah, I think I have two. That's, that's a great question to close with. I think the first is that I would say if there is an issue that you're seeing locally, provincially, federally, do consider what you can do to change it. It's not always about starting something new. Sometimes it's just about doing some research and finding organizations that are already doing amazing work and just joining forces with them. Um, I know we're all time strapped, but I do think everyone has five minutes, 10 minutes in their day, maybe an hour or two a month that they can give to begin to consider what they can do for their greater community. And so I think it's just about aligning your interests with the work that you do or the, the volunteer time that you have to really try to change your community for the better. That sounds a bit generic, but I really think that's so important. I think if everyone did a little something, I think we'd be able to move things forward in a positive way. I think the second thing that I would say is get outside. Um, I know that for me, nature has been such an important grounding way that I can rejuvenate myself outside of work. I can de-stress. And I think that a huge part of that is actually being outside and exploring um, even the urban settings of nature here in Toronto. I live right downtown. So um, you would think that I probably have the least access to nature than anyone else um, or anyone else in the country, maybe who live in more scenic, beautiful areas. Um, but for me, finding those spaces of greenery or even just going closer to the lake and, you know, seeing water, I can I think is just so refreshing. And I I really encourage people to get outside. And if you can get outside and find community outside, there are so many amazing organizations like Let's, Let's Like To across Canada. Um, and I think that if people access them, it's a great way of meeting new friends, but also, you know, rejuvenating yourself and allowing yourself to, to rest while getting a bit of exercise as well. Thank you so much, Kamara, for your remarkable leadership and all the actionable insights that you provide us. And as always at Setsi, we close by once again acknowledging our creator and giving thanks to our creator, acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Kamara. We so appreciate you. Thanks so much, Victor. It was lovely talking to you.